Hello everyone, my name is Anna Pasulevic and I work at Bitplay. I would like to welcome you to this Bitplay webinar entitled Serial to Photon Tomography, Whole Brain Imaging Revealing 3D Anger Architecture of Mice Brain. This webinar is part of the One Size Matter series of lectures which focuses on new imaging techniques which enable researchers to study very large samples at cellular resolution. So far we have covered optical projection tomography, light sheet microscopy and tissue clearing technique clarity. We will have three speakers today, Dr. Tim Ragan, Dr. Cassandra Kisler, and Arvon Tali. It's my pleasure to introduce and welcome today's first speaker, Dr. Tim Ragan. Dr. Ragan is the CEO of Tissue Vision. Uh, his company provides the tissue site, which is the world's only serial to photon tomography system engineered specifically for fully automated whole organ imaging in as little as four hours, without any user intervention and with micron resolution and beyond. I would encourage you to type questions in the chatbot as and when you think of them. This will be addressed in the Q&A session at the end. The more question asks, the better the session would be. I would like to hand over to Dr. Ragan to begin this presentation. Hey, Anna, thanks so much for the uh, introduction there. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about um, serial two-photon tomography. Uh, as Anna was mentioning, it's an automated method that allows one to image entire organs with subcellular resolution. Uh, we started working on this over 10 years ago. In the last few years, it's resulted in several high-profile publications from our customers, and we've been really happy about that. And I'll be showing you some of this uh, later in the presentation. Before I begin, though, I'd like to also thank everyone at BitPlane for putting together the webinar. I know they put a lot of time and effort into making this happen, and we appreciate all the work that they've done. So, as Anand mentioned, as the first part of the webinar, I'll be giving an in-depth overview of how STP tomography works, and then show some of the results we got in imaging vascular trees here uh, inside the company. Uh, first, let me give you just a really brief overview of uh, tissue vision. Uh, we founded it a little over 10 years ago based on some of the imaging research we were doing in Peter So's group at MIT. Um, Peter's a high-speed multi-photon imaging guy, and we, back then we had a lot of interesting biological questions we were uh, trying to address and uh, being able to do these um, answer these questions, we needed to do these in a uh, way that allowed us to image very large macroscopic tissues in 3D with high resolution and to do it also very quickly. So as we're working on solving some of these problems, other research groups were expressing a lot of interest in the tools we were developing. And so we decided the best way to push the technology forward was to start a company, which we did. And with the help of uh, several um, NIH grants, um, SBIR grants, we were able to build a commercial version of the academic prototype. And we uh, sold the first instrument to Pavel Austin's group at Cold Spring Harbor Labs. And uh, we worked with this group pretty closely over the next couple of years and ended up with a nice paper coming out in Nature Methods showing how the technology could be used to image whole mouse brains. So since then, we've sold uh, instruments to a variety of groups in North America, Europe, and Asia, and uh, continuing to do some more instrument development as well as um, some uh, assay development in uh, imaging services. So enough of that. And now let's go ahead and get back into the uh, science. So here's a chart that shows the different levels of biological complexity. So you can see as we move from investigating things like DNA and proteins all the way up to entire organisms, it becomes much more difficult, uh, much more expensive to do. Um, and there's a number of tools out there right now which you can use to study DNA and proteins and cells in a very high throughput manner but there are a lack of corresponding tools for tissues and whole organs. So for instance, sequencing technologies now has been advancing very rapidly. Uh, we're now at the point where we can get the $1,000 genome. And there are many 2D imaging platforms out there, uh, such as uh, an enclosed cytometry instrumentation, which allows you to do high content screening of thousands of cells at a time. However, it's proven much more of a challenge to do the same with tissues, especially large 3D tissues at subcellular resolution. Historically, it's a very difficult, very expensive undertaking. And that's where we come in here at the company, trying to build these tools and develop assays that make these sorts of whole organ studies possible. So what 
were the techniques that you had to use about 10 years ago when we were looking at this. You wanted to get very high quality histological level images. Um, the main method researchers used back then is to do serial section analysis. And it's still used quite a bit nowadays, and for good reasons, because while it has some shortcomings on the throughput side, it does allow very high image quality. And how it works is, as many of you are probably aware, as you get a microtome, uh, you will section a tissue. Each of the tissues is then placed onto a slide. Uh, these slides are then transferred over uh, to a staining auto stainer and stained uh, using a particular uh, dye of interest. But then transferred over to a microscope, typically a wide field fluorescence uh, scope, and then imaged. And if you want to build up a 3D model of this, what you really need to do is to take all these images, put them into a computer, and build a 3D model based on that. So while this thing works, it has some very severe disadvantages. It's, it's enormously labor intensive. Uh, it's artifact ridden. The uh, sectioning process that you have to use uh, uh, gives you irreducible deformations into the tissue, which you can't recover from. And in the end, you have something which is just not scalable. It's not high throughput. So looking at this, we had to come up with something different. And therefore, we sat down with a blank piece of paper, decided what was the stuff that was really important in any sort of technique that we wanted to develop. And here's some of the criteria that we came up with. The very first was we wanted something which is going to be very easy to use. Um, we wanted it to you know, be very automated. Uh, something which it wasn't going to take a lot of effort from an individual researcher to actually accomplish. Also, it had to be compatible with a lot of the current histological practices that people were using. Um, so a lot of uh, effort's been put in the last you know, several decades, and we wanted to make sure we could take advantage of as many of those um, uh, uh, you know, developments people have done as possible. And we want to have something that's very um, capable of doing high resolution, uh, less than one micron. Uh, one micron is a very important number in our minds. You know, above that, you really can't see a lot of the specific cellular details of, of, of interest. For example, things like dendritic, dendritic spines, or even pulling out some of the uh, features of a, a vascular tree, as we'll see a little bit later in the presentation. Of course, we wanted something which is going to be multispectral, multimodal, have all the fluorescence specificity. Um, no pre-sectioning of tissues to get around any uh, problems with the damage that I mentioned earlier. Um, and again, this is probably the most important thing in our minds is have something which is very, very reproducible, something that you could look at and say, look, we want to have a study where we want to do tens, maybe even hundreds of samples. Um, and in our view, I think the most exciting science we're going to see for the next 10, 15, 20 years is going to be studies which involve whole organs, you're looking at tens and hundreds of samples. We know we've seen some analogies in the field of genomics where the most interesting results nowadays are coming from well-designed studies with large number of samples, and you can generate sufficient statistical power to, to reveal some genuine biological differences. Now, I think the same is going to be happening with these whole organ studies, and we're just beginning to see some of that. So finally, we wanted something which is going to be reproducible and fast and entirely automated. So what we chose is a better alternative based on two-photon microscopy. Um, many of you are familiar with it, so I won't go into detail. But just briefly, uh, two-photon microscopy is a 3D imaging technique, which is particularly well-suited for uh, tissues. It's an optical fluorescence-based technique, so you get all the fluorescent specificity that you get um, by using fluorescence-based approaches. Um, unlike focal, though, it's an inherently 3D and you can quickly generate thin uh, sections throughout a, a tissue. And uh, these 3D images can also be built up by scanning multiple imaging planes throughout the depth of a tissue. So while it has a lot of these advantages, though, one of the disadvantages is that you can't image down past a certain point. So typically in in vivo brain studies, you can only image down uh, perhaps four, 500 microns into the tissue. Um, that's not going to be enough if you want to do an entire organ. So we thought, how can we overcome this problem? And um, since we're dealing with tissue which is already dead, um, we thought the best way of doing this is just to incorporate an automated, automated vibratome into the system. So the procedure we can do is we image down to a certain depth that's above our maximum imaging depth, cut the 
sample and then just repeat this process. So here's the brain getting sectioned off. As I mentioned before, this is a 50 micron section uh, of a brain tissue embedded in agar. Um, we're sectioning it off with a vibratome. You can't tell, but it's vibrating back and forth about at 60 hertz. And as the um, tissue section comes off, it goes into the water bath, and you can either uh, collect all these later, um, or you can collect them on the fly, and that's something we're uh, developing right now, too. So you can do a lot of uh, more advanced uh, biochemistry on the tissue slices afterwards, since they all can be saved and retrieved. Um, so in the end, after you repeat this process of sectioning and imaging, what you end up with is an entire uh, uh, mouse brain. So this is an uh, image of a mouse brain which, which has been uh, is transgenically expressing YFP neurons, and you can see all that detail throughout there. Now, I mentioned with serial section analysis, you had a lot of problems when you tried to reconstruct this. So up at the top here, here's the old way of doing it. This is a slide scanner, uh, fluorescent slide scanner. And what you're seeing is uh, the brain kind of jumping around and, and a lot of distortions in the tissue as we're doing that. And it gets a little bit worse as we go further and along in here. And this is because you had to suction the tissue before you imaged it. In comparison, the way we're doing it, we're always imaging before we're suctioning. So we get automated, automatic seed registration as we fly throughout the brain. And you can see that going down in the movie uh, below. So one of the tricks we had to uh, we did to uh, pull this off is we had to actually end up designing our own custom uh, vibratome. Um, tried to use some commercial ones and put them into the system, but that just didn't work. So we had teamed up with a couple of our mechanical engineering friends over in the Mech E department, and they ended up designing this pretty novel uh, dual flexure linkage vibratome, and it's been working like a champ. And, and you kind of think like you're developing a photocopier, you know, what's the jam rate? And we've gotten the jam rate to be down pretty low, about you know, one section in I don't know how many thousands. You'll get a really nice uh, you know, uh, section quality on this. So that's pretty important when you want to look at you know, tens of uh, brains. Um, and coming up next here is another movie of the same data set. And we're just rotating this around, giving an idea that you can really see a lot of the uh, 3D st structure um, as you're doing this. Now, if you look on the side there, what you're seeing is some little striations along the brains. What those are, those are the 100 micron sections of the uh, brain. Now, it's not necessary to do 100 micron spacing. You can do full 3D imaging with this, if you'd like, by just doing volume stacks and overlapping them appropriately. But you want to choose the amount of data uh, that you need in order to solve the biological question of interest becomes, you know, these whole brain data sets, they quickly become very unmanageable. And we can zoom in a little bit here too, and um, this is to look at the actual images from that same data set. Um, on the left, you have a, a picture of uh, some of the neurons within the uh, brain tissue, and we have some uh, blown up portions of that um, tissue off to the right, and we're just showing different sampling sizes where we've gone back and on the fly we can change the uh, resolution of the microscope as we image. So at the top you see 1.4 micron pixels, uh, 0.7 micron pixels, and 0.35 micron pixels with increasing uh, level of detail on that. Now I've, up to now I've shown you just single color images. Um, but the system is, uh, three, can do three color acquisition. We'll be adding a fourth channel next year. Um, so on the left here, what you're seeing is an embryo, which is uh, expressing some uh, autofluorescence and uh, transgenic uh, YFP. On the right here is an entire mouse heart, which you imaged back a few years ago. Um, and so you're seeing um, the uh, heart tissue, which is in red. Uh, you're seeing the vasculature, which has been labeled with a intravital labeling technique. So we've actually injected this dye into the mouse before we sacrificed it. And the nuclei are labeled in blue by injecting DAPI into the animal, too. Off to the left here, this is just a tumor model where we, the drug is 
uh, expressing it for us, and um, or the uh, a, a drug delivery device is, is expressing a uh, fluorescent uh, drug uh, in the uh, inside the tumor. Um, now we can also do full 3D volumetric imaging. Uh, this is just I won't go through this entire video in the interest of time, but what you're looking at here is an olfactory bulb. Um, this has been imaged with uh, 800 coronal sections. Uh, these are spaced at 2.5 microns apart. And we're just flying through the um, olfactory bulb um, on this. And the images were downsampled by about a factor of five as we're uh, doing this. I can speed this up a little bit as you can, uh, in the interest of time here. So, oops, I went a little too far. Here we are. So, so finally, let me go back and explain the, um, uh, the workflow here. I think this is probably one of the most important points I want to make is that it's a, it's a very sa simple sample preparation procedure. You just do a uh, straightforward perfusion fixation. Uh, this is the same sort of protocol labs use uh, all the time. You then embed this uh, tissue sample or organ into an agarose block, place it into the microscope system, and depending on the parameters that you choose, uh, you just push a few buttons, set it up, and a number of hours later, you'll get out the entire data set. So we, we, you know, we wanted something, you know, protocol which is going to be very robust and lend itself to, to uh, larger high throughput studies. And I, I think the best example of this by far is what one of our customers, uh, the Allen Institute for Brain Science, has done with the technology. And um, they have the Allen Mouse Brain Connectivity Atlas, which they uh, um, have out in uh, Seattle, which they've been using the tissue site system to go through an image of about 2,500 mouse brains, I think, at this point. And you can find a lot of the details about this study on their website. Um, but let me pull up actually a um, uh, web page here, and I'll show you the data very quickly. Here is the Allen webpage, and uh, each one of these little dots on this brain is one of the injection regions they use to construct the connectivity atlas. And if you click on one of those, and we'll see how the internet works between Boston and Seattle, and you can go over here and uh, launch a 2D viewer of the images. They done a really a lot of nice work developing a bioinformatics pipeline around this. You can see a lot of the actual data that they've taken uh, from these 2,500 uh, data uh, mouse brains. Let me uh, zoom in a bit here on this. Get a little bit more detail. So that's some of the stuff they have online there. So I encourage you to go check that out. They did a lot of really nice work, and especially with the bioinformatics on the back side of this, I think it's going to be a big resource for the community over the next uh, several years. Go ahead and start up back up the PowerPoint here. So just quickly, um, I'll mention some of the contrast strategies and then look at some of the vascular data. But if you want to uh, think of you know, what are the different things that you can see using this technique, uh, one of the things we've been really uh, worked, worked really well with is just simple autofluorescence. Um, there's a nice difference in intensity between the background autofluorescence and any XFPs that you may have within the issue. Um, also doing things like viral injections, as we just saw on the Allen website. We can also get second harmonic generation in CARS. SRS works well if you choose the appropriate laser source. Of course, any sort of transgenic models is going to work extremely well. And also intravital labeling uh, approaches that we uh, showed earlier with the heart is also another good way. Finally, one of our customers up in Toronto uh, at the MICE uh, Imaging Center, they developed a whole organ immunohistochemistry protocol where you can go through and introduce antibodies into unsectioned tissue and go through and image these uh, organs uh, using our, our microscope. And they have a nice paper that came out last year in PLOS One showing some of the detail of that. And we're also working on some advanced immune histochemistry uh, protocols. We have something which we think is going to be pretty exciting 
and I know a lot of people out there are pretty interested in doing immunohistochemistry on whole organs. So if you are, uh, you know, send us an email afterwards and we can talk a little bit more about that, but we're not going to have time in this presentation today. And finally, we have the vasculature, and I'll move on to that next. So this is where I can show some of the nice movies that um, Bitplane put together for us um, using Imeris. So here is, uh, let's see, stop the um, presentation. So here is a, about uh, two and a half millimeters worth of a mouse brain um, where we've gone through and we've imaged the vasculature with it. So you can see you can get a lot of the nice 3D morphology with this and um, really nice contrast too. Let's uh, pick another movie here, too, and this is another one that Arvon put together for us. Um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more closely on this so you can see some more of the detail in the actual um, uh, vasculature. Now, how we did this is we're using a protocol that a group out in UC San Diego uh, demonstrated a few years back in a uh, Nature Neuroscience article where we we're actually injecting a uh, polyacrylamide slash agarose gel into the animal as we're doing the perfusion fixation. And this gel has a uh, fluorescent probe conjugated to it. So we're actually filling up the vasculature with a fluorescent uh, dye. And that lets you to get the very high contrast. And you can choose essentially any dye that you want. So you can you know, have a lot of freedom in making sure that the vasculature is labeled with something which won't interfere with other components of the tissue that you're uh, trying to study at the same time. So here's one final video. Um, you can get a fly through through some of the uh, vasculature here. This is all raw data straight off the microscope. We um, just stack this stuff together so there hasn't been any fine uh, registration between successive sections, uh, just to give you an idea of what kind of stuff you can get straight from the scope. It looks a little bit like the creature from the uh, movie Aliens, I think, in some ways. So that's the last of the videos. I have some more from uh, Cassandra. She's going to show you. And um, I think after that point, uh, when I have left just one more slide to show you, um, this is some of the publications that have been coming out in the last year and a half. Um, you know, researchers have done a lot of hard work getting these out there, and we're really happy to start seeing some uh, actual science coming out of the technology. So uh, you can find some of these citations on our web page, so be sure to check them out. And I think at that point, I'm going to hand it back over to Cassandra and let her take it from there, and she can show you some of the work they've been doing in the uh, Slokovic group out at uh, USC. Okay, thank you very much, Tim, for your presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce and welcome Cassandra, Dr. Cassandra Kistler, who is today's second speaker. Dr. Cassandra Kistler is the member of Dr. Borisław Zlokowicz Lab at Zilka Neurogenetic Institute in Keck School of Medicine, University of Southern California. Dr. Kistler will present the group's work studying the role of parasites in health and disease. Recent studies in their lab have shown that parasites regulate vascular stability and angio architecture in the blood-brain barrier. Parasites degenerate in Alzheimer's disease. Based on the findings, Dr. Zlokovic's group is extending their studies using STP tomography to generate a high-resolution 3D model of the angular architecture in animal models of disease. Dr. Kisler will present the research and data collected also by other members of the group, Dr. Abbe Sagarle and Ashim Ahuya. I would encourage you to, again to type questions in the chat pod as and when you think of them. I would like to hand over to Dr. Kistler to begin this presentation. Thank you very much for that introduction. Can you guys see this okay? All I can see right now is my presentation. Um, so um, I am uh, a postdoc in Dr. Zlokovic's lab, and I'm joined today by uh, my colleagues Abai Sagari and Ashim 
Uh, here we go. Um, so we're going to talk about more than just pericytes today, uh, but let me give you a little bit of an introduction first. So uh, vasculature in the brain, how important is that for us? If you think about the brain itself, it's only 2% of your body weight, but it consumes about 20% of the energy that your body uh, inputs, which means it's taking up about 20% of the cardiac output. Uh, and that means that all these vessels have to get the energy from uh, the blood into your brain. And this is kind of 3D imaging here, uh, circa 1998. Uh, so we're looking to update this for what, what we do. And uh, today, let me start by giving you a little bit of a background of the blood-brain barrier and the neurovascular unit. So we study what we call the neurovascular unit, which is not just vessels and neurons, but it's an integrated system with substantial cross-communication between the cell types. And uh, we, you know, we have the blood delivering the oxygen and nutrients to the brain. It has to cross over the, uh, what we call the blood-brain barrier, which is the endothelium that uh, creates and lines blood vessels. And in large vessels, uh, is covered by the vascular smooth muscle and then astrocytes. And in small vessels such as capillaries, it's uh, covered by these specialized cells called pericytes and, again, astrocytes. And all these cells communicate with each other, astrocytes, glia, neurons in the brain. Um, so in our lab, we focus on the blood-brain barrier, and we study uh, Alzheimer's disease, ALS, and stroke primarily, and how the vasculature coupling contributes to the severity of these conditions. So today I'm going to focus on just two things that we're working on in the lab. Um, one, apolipoprotein E, which is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, and uh, the role of pericytes and their uh, contribution to the blood-brain barrier integrity. Um, so apolipoprotein E, or ApoE, uh, comes in three flavors in humans. Uh, alleles ApoE2 and 3 are considered to be uh, kind of the normal or protective versions. ApoE4, however, uh, seems to be a genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And so we've done some studies on this in uh, transgenic animal models where we've, uh, are, or where there has been a uh, humanized form of ApoE replacing the mouse form of ApoE. And you can see in the right-hand side here, uh, when we have this ApoE4 allele expressed in the animals, you see a lot more of this MMP9 activity around the vessels and into the, the parenchyma of the tissue. And that uh, indicates that there's a leaky blood-brain barrier there compared to uh, the normal ApoE3 allele. Um, we also notice that there is less blood flow by cerebral, uh, cerebral blood flow autoradiography. Uh, so reds and yellows are good, and so we get lots of blood flow, blood flow in the ApoE3 animals and less so in the ApoE4. And when we uh, do this in live animals, we inject a dye into the vasculature and wait a few minutes. Uh, the ApoE3 animals uh, maintain the dye in the vasculature. However, the ApoE4, because of this leaky blood-brain barrier that's been uh, created in this state, uh, the dye leaks out into the brain. And then in the bottom, you can see um, another test of vasculature integrity, where we've looked at cadaverin, which has been added into the blood vessels. And it's a small molecule that, in uh, when there is a damage in the blood-brain barrier, that it leaks out into the brain, and all these neurons, the green cells here, are taking it up. Um, so that's uh, one of our studies. And we also look at um, pericytes. 
which, uh, as I said before, cover the uh, capillaries and microvessels. And they, they have this morphology, kind of like bumps on a log down the vas vasculature. And in your brain, they cover about 80% of the capillaries. Uh, so they're very prevalent, very uh, uh, important to the vasculature, and are implicated in vascular genesis as well. Um, and we study these not only in the brain, but also in the spinal cord for some of our studies, like for ALS. Um, here, a uh, control animal with PDGFR beta, which is a marker in pericytes uh, and a receptor. Uh, we see that there is a fair amount of yellow in the covering the vasculature indicating uh, pericyte coverage. Uh, in a model of uh, pericyte deficient animals, we see much less uh, coverage. So what does it mean when you don't have these pericyte cells in the vasculature? Um, in a wild-type control animal, we see that vasculature here loaded with uh, omega dexatran dye uh, is uh, intact. And uh, animals that are missing some of this PDGFR beta receptor, uh, as I showed in the last slide, where they have fewer number of pericytes covering the vasculature. They start out OK when they're young, but as they age, the uh, vasculature degrades and becomes um, much less dense. Along with these changes in the vasculature, we see that as the animals age, we get uh, opening of the blood-brain barrier and leakage through the vessels of these uh, blood products like IgG into the uh, extracellular, extravascular space. And then we also, since we're looking at uh, Alzheimer's, we're looking also at amyloid depositions into the brain and how that relates to the vasculature. Uh, and so far, everything I've shown you has been either confocal or multi-photon imaging. And that means that we have to take anything we do and kind of squish it into two dimensions. Uh, what we'd like to do is look at these things in three dimensions and uh, really get more information about what's going on in the brain and what we can do with it. So with that in mind, we've uh, gone to uh, Tim Reagan's STP tomography imaging microscope, and uh, we're trying out this new uh, MRS software to uh, generate 3D renderings of our vasculature in these model animals and uh, see what kind of additional data we can get out of it. So this is just a column through the uh, cortex. And uh, here you can see the vasculature that we've labeled in lectin. Uh, this is pretty much raw data. Uh, and uh, this is what it looks like. We can do whole cortex or whole brain if we wanted. Cassandra, um, uh, we stopped seeing your screen. Could you share it again? I do. Okay, well, the, sure. the slides are blocked. The, sli the slides don't move, so could you try to? Yeah, we see your screen, but they were not moving, so we didn't see the video. You think it's the video? Um, so do you see the screen now? Yes. Yes, OK. Let me try this again. Thank you. All right, so does the movie rotate now? I hope. <clears throat> yes, this is uh, just not really. It's not. Uh, it's not seen. I can. I can share the movie so you.
of the screen. All right, I'm sorry, do you have it here? I'm not seeing anything coming. So just stop sharing, can you? Okay. So we can go to the next slide, maybe, if there is a problem with videos. Okay, let's see what we can do here. All right, so this is still image, so hopefully that will help a little bit. Uh, so we're looking at vasculature in three dimensions and how uh, these risk factors and uh, pericyte deficiencies affect the vasculature. But first, we wanted to make sure that what we're measuring is really an accurate reflection of what we know from before, what has been recorded in the literature. So uh, looking through a column of cortical tissue, uh, we measured the vasculature density as a function of depth into the cortex. And you can see that around layer four, you get a little bit of an increase in the density, which is consistent with what's been reported in other groups, uh, like uh, Kleinfield's group in San Diego, for example. Uh, so we're pretty happy that this is working and we're moving forward with these things. Um, and as I mentioned before, we also look at uh, ALS models. And so we're looking at imaging not only in the brain, but in the spinal cord. And hopefully this movie will work. Uh, it's just um, vasculature in the spinal cord, which we are again taking 3D images and reconstructing. And um, with that, this is our last slide. And I want to say a special thanks to Asham, who put together a lot of these images and did a lot of the, the work for us here. So with that, uh, OK. Thank you very much, Cassandra, for your presentation. And now it's my pleasure to introduce and welcome today's first speaker, Arvon Pali. Arvon is an advanced application special scientist in Bitplane. He provides advanced imaging solutions for researchers and specializes in multi-dimension high-resolution image acquisition, microscopy systems troubleshooting, image analysis, and experimental design to facilitate image analysis. Now I would like to hand over to Arvon to begin his presentation and live demo of Imari software. Uh, hi, uh, good evening to, and uh, good afternoon to everyone else. Um, so I just was hoping to show you guys a little bit of um, the uh, imaging that, that's possible with Imaris. Um, so it's possible to even go in and, and once these files have been loaded, uh, you can just go in and take a look at these really uh, beautiful images and tremendous data sets uh, that uh, Tim's uh, system is creating uh, from these wonderful data sets. So, so I'd like to show you a couple of the images that uh, these groups have been working on today and that we've been working with. So here is uh, that vasculature um, from the mouse brain, a couple, mi a couple millimeter section they were looking at. And we can see that this has a really fantastic resolution. Uh, you know, it's nearly 10,000 by 6,000 by 1,200 D slices with a point, uh, basically 100 nanometer resolution throughout the entire data set. So this is a really a, a phenomenal data set. It's over 170 gigabytes of raw data. And so we can quickly and easily take a look at this data and, and go in and you know, even go to a one-to-one -one zoom and see what's going on here. 
and uh, take a look at some of these you know, blood vessels at a, at a very detailed level. Now, there is still a little bit of uh, work that needs to be done on this image. Uh, some, some further corrections that can be done to, to get this a little bit better, but um, it's, it's very nearly raw data, and it looks really just fantastic in terms of, of being able to quickly and easily look at all these blood vessels. And, you know, I think it's something uh, that, you know, we're working on to improve the, the tracing and start to get out measurements from all of the different blood vessels in this entire uh, system. So you can really go through and see all the different layers and, and what the different uh, parts of the brain look like. And, you know, we can even go in here and take a look and see, uh, you know, where these blood vessels are, are located. And, I, you know, I think at some point in the future we're going to be able to automatically, to fully automatically segment this. It is possible now to, to segment portions of the data set, but really the computers and algorithms are not, uh, we're able to visualize it for sure, but we're not quite there yet when it comes to um, uh, measuring the entire data set and, you know, cataloging every blood vessel and mapping out the entire structure, but I think we're getting there. And, so, you know, this is just taking a look at one of these uh, really gorgeous images. I'm just trying to go real slow here, so hopefully everyone can see this and see what's going on. And um, I can show a couple other images uh, for some things that we can do um, that are really, really quite impressive. So this is, give it a moment to update here. Um, this is one of the, the data sets uh, from Cassandra and Ashim's lab. Um, and so, you know, we can take a look at this gorgeous, you know, high, highly detailed, you know, section of the, the blood vessel. And, you know, what's possible, once once somebody has gone through and done all this imaging and, you know, sectioned out this brain and, and images, now we can start to do things like looking at uh, one, let's see here, I've got to adjust the level slightly, and, you know, we can start to go through and look at this data set and pull out the individual vessels and just look at these individual vessels and see what's going on here. We can see, you know, where is this vessel going? You know, what's happening here? Is it interacting? We can see where it goes from one side of this data set. We can even follow it through the entire section of the brain. And, you know, we can start to say, ah, oh, look, you know, maybe there's a uh, section that's going off there. And see where the other, you know, we can start to see where these interactions are. So, so it's going to be, you can see that I think we're on the cusp of, of being able to map these entire um, you know, these entire really beautiful and massive uh, vasculature systems and to get, kind of understand more of what's going on and uh, help improve the science. So I, I think that's really all. Um, I can also show you one more section, uh, another section of brain here. Uh, give us a moment to update. Uh, and this is, again, some of these massive section of brain tissue. And this is a neuron label. I think Tim might know exactly what um, what's labeled here, but it's really uh, incredible because with the tissue vision and the tissue site, you can take these huge sections of tissue and then go through and pull out just a few individual neurons in this entire brain section. And, you know, we can already go through and do some uh, segmentation and measuring these neurons, and we're going to start to be able to find out the paths, you know, not just of one set of neurons, but we're going to be able to take this set of neurons and to go through and connect it to multiple sets of neurons and find out uh, what's going on here. So I think this is a really exciting time in imaging and um, you know, look forward to working with these guys and, and hopefully all of you in the future. Um, are there are any questions that I can answer? Um, okay, thank you Arvon very much. Uh, we'll be if you have any questions to Arvon, please type them. And now we'll be moving to a question and answer session. Uh, so uh, you sent some questions for our speaker, speakers, and we can start from questions uh, that were addressed to Tim. So, sure. so first question uh, from Jess Wand is, we are working with cow brains. Will be this vibratum be able to cut through hypothalamus? The dimensions are 9 centimeters for 8 centimeters for 15 centimeters. So we're developing a, a bigger version of the vibratum right now, and our goal is to be able to do 8 centimeters across. So we couldn't quite do that. Um, now, we can do 15 centimeters along the uh, long direction of the stage. 
um, that wouldn't be a problem. Uh, doing it down to additional 15 centimeters in, in depth, um, that would be a bit of a challenge, I think. Uh, I think it's not so much a question of, of, of sectioning. That's something we can pull off. But just the imaging time is going to become extremely prohibitive because that, that's a pretty massive data set at that point. OK, thank you. And the next question is, what substances or tissues type have you tried to image but had difficulty with, for lack of penetration with the serial to photon tomography or, or vibratum? Um, generally, we're pretty good with just about all tissues. Um, some tissues have less penetration depth with the imaging, of course. Um, like heart tissue, for instance, uh, you can only really image down maybe 100 to 125 microns before you start losing contrast. Uh, you can go deeper in brain tissue. Um, going through stuff like bone can be a problem. You can um, do things, though, by treating the bone with um, various uh, uh, chemicals to decalcify it, though, and that can be one option uh, to try to address that. But in general, I mean, we have a, a wide variety of tissues that we can uh, uh, image. You know, anything that you've been able to image with two photon microscopy before, we should be able to image with two photon microscopy now. Okay, thank you. And now, uh, next question to you. So do you know why there is an uneven elimination in near ventricles? Uh, tissues surrounding the ventricles sometimes, sometimes are dark. Yeah, so that's a pretty technical question. And um, what's happening there is you're probably not getting a perfect uh, uh, fixation. If you uh, don't have, you can blow out the ventricles in, in, in essence. So you need to be careful about using the right pressure uh, when you're doing the perfusion fixation. Uh, I think the Allen Institute had a problem with that initially, but once they tweaked their perfusion protocol, that went away. So I'm suspecting that's what you're probably seeing. Okay, thank you. So another question to you is, uh, what is the largest data set you have acquired? The largest data set? Um, that's a good question. I think we've gotten some which How big you can go? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there's really, the currently, we're, uh, the current system, we can go you know, about three centimeters by two centimeters by about uh, three centimeters in depth, so we can accommodate rat brains without a problem. Um, we're going to be moving up to doing marmoset brains also. Um, you know, there's no real practical limitation. You just need to get a bigger stage and a bigger water bath for that. And I think the real limitation, like with any, any imaging technology, is, is going to be the imaging time. OK, thank you. Uh, so another question to you is, is it possible to image entire 3D brain? And if yes, how much time it takes? Uh, depending on the resolution, um, I, you should get somewhere between, let's say, three days up to four, five, six days um, to do an entire brain. This is doing a full 3D stack, is assuming that's what the question is asking about. So let's say one micron pixels uh, in the X and the Y and two micron pixels in the uh, Z. And it okay. doesn't matter the number of channels. Those are all acquired simultaneously. All right. So another question for team will be, uh, you mentioned that your system will might support four channels soon. Is that a hardware yep. software change? I, if one has the system, that is, uh, can you do the upgrade? Any limitations um, being given more channels? No, no, we can definitely do an upgrade on that. It's just that we'd be changing out some of the electronics uh, and just adding a fourth PNT detector inside the system. And so we have the ability to do that. OK, thank you. Uh, and have you any progress with the new stitching protocol for the data set from tissue side? Um, yes. So we're actually uh, developing a very high-speed stitching algorithm um, where we can stitch the stuff, stitch the images on the fly. So uh, the goal here is, is to have the stitching done um, as soon as the imaging is done effectively. So we're just about there. Uh, we'll be sending that out probably in the next uh, few weeks. We have the, uh, the coding's been done. We're just going through and tweaking it right now.
Okay, thank you. And uh, I think the last question for team is: Are there AIHC protocols that you can penetrate for that can penetrate whole brain? So I mentioned in my talk that our, uh, one of our collaborators up at the Mice uh, Imaging Center in Toronto at the Sick Kids Hospital uh, have a paper out in PLOS One where they shown uh, the ability to do at least hemispheres of brains using a novel freeze-thaw cycle. So this doesn't require any sort of clearing. Uh, they can get antibodies in there by uh, doing a, um, a protocol that they developed. Uh, you can find that uh, reference to the paper on our website. And we're also developing a new IHC uh, imaging method. Um, I can't really talk too much about that right now, um, but um, we're going to be uh, showing that off more in the next uh, few months. We're pretty excited about it, and I think it's going to be uh, have a lot of utility to, uh, with it. Okay, thank you very much. So now I will switch to questions to Cassandra. There was there was one question to Cassandra, and Cassandra, are you are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. So the question was, why does layer four increase increase vasculation vasculation because of thalamic input? What's the reason? Um, actually, there isn't, there's a lot of speculation. I think people don't know very well. Uh, layer 4 is the highest density of cell bodies in the cortex, though, so my suspicion is that it has something to do with that, and you just need more, more vasculature to, it, to feed the, uh, the cells right there. Okay. Thank you. This was one question addressed to you, and now we can switch the questions addressed to Arvan. Arvan, are you there? Uh, yes, here. Uh, okay, so uh, one question is how accurately you can segment the vasculature in a small volume? <clears throat> uh, I don't think we've gotten to the point where we can um, uh, we haven't gone through and manually uh, um, verified it yet, but uh, I'm trying to show an example, and I'm, I'm hoping this is actually going to show up, of, 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 um, of some blood vessels that were segmented. So here, here's kind of the, here's the original data, and then um, hopefully I can get the vast the tracing to show up here. I've been having a little bit of trouble. It seems like the uh, Tracing is not, um, there we go. Uh, it seems like it's not working very well with the screen sharing today. Uh, but this is kind of showing what the uh, um, tracing might look like, uh, what, what it does look like um, from, from that data. So I'm going to switch to a line view. Hopefully this is a little bit better. And I can make that look a bit better here, hopefully. Uh, but, it, but it is, in fact, possible to, to do some segmentation. It's still a bit, um, a bit tough to see, a bit slow. Um, but it is possible to go through and pull out the statistics. And OK, sure. what statistics you can get from the segmentation? Uh, like uh, the, the length of the processes, the length of these vessels, the, the diameter. Um, unfortunately, it's such, a, it's such a thick mass of vessels that uh, whenever we try to show this on the screen, it really um, almost becomes hard to, to see what's going on here. And of course, uh, Amaris is not cooperating with the screen sharing just at this moment. Um, but things like uh, the branching, the, the level of the branching, uh, it's possible to get that. I'd like to try and show that if possible here, but it, uh, it is not cooperating right at the moment, this moment. You know, while Arvon is trying to figure that out, I can jump in here. Now, I think with the uh, casting uh, protocol we were showing earlier, you can get a pretty good signal to noise, uh, you know, something from even you know, 10 to 20 to 1 versus background. And for segmentation, you probably get pretty good results just by doing a simple threshold.
Okay, thank you, Jim. Okay, Arvind. So, if uh, if the screen, if the video, sorry, if the if the data set is not working today, uh, we can maybe finish. I don't see any more questions. Yeah, yeah, that works, that works for me. Okay. Um, so I'd like to thank you for participation and submitting some very good questions. And any questions uh, that we were unable to answer or you feel our answer was insufficient, uh, we will be passed to the speakers and we will try to contact you later with an answer. So now I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all speakers for their presentation and to also thank the attendees of today's webinar. Further information uh, can be found on, on uh, www.bitplane.com slash sumo, and there you can find recordings of previous webinars and sign up for upcoming, upcoming webinars in the When Size Matters series. The next webinar is coming up in January and features a talk on three-dimensional neural connectivity atlas of dragonfly ganglia and cephalot skin innervation. You can follow the conversation on Facebook or Twitter by using the hashtag Wednesdays Matters. Also, we will be in the upcoming Society for Neurosciences meeting in Washington, D.C. from the 15th to 19th of November. Come by the booth and to see Imar's Ace for the first time and play our SFN 2014 game and maybe win a prize. And don't forget there will be a recording of this webinar that will also be available online very shortly. So thank you everyone and hope you have a good day.